Hey, good evening, everyone. Welcome to Science on Tap Virtual, where we can go and sipping with science. Tonight's event, Bioacoustics, What the Planet Has to Say, is a co-production uh, between the South Florida Science Center and Aquarium and the University of Florida's Thompson Earth Systems Institute. Special thanks to our featured brews and bites to go partners this evening, Do South Brewing and Savory Eats Food Truck. Did you all stop by to get those brews and bites and snacks before coming to the event? You guys can comment below, mention, let us know if you went over and got those snacks. Um, the South Florida Science Center and Aquarium provides curious minds of all ages with an entertaining and educational journey through the latest discoveries in science and technology. It features more than 100 interactive exhibits, an aquarium, a planetarium, Florida conservation themed miniature golf course, the world's most advanced exhibit on the human brain, and so much more. Now serving over 300,000 students and visitors annually, provide a mind opening experience for all. Hi everyone. The Thompson Earth Systems Institute or TESI is located at the University of Florida's Gainesville campus. Our mission is to advance communication and education of earth system science in a way that inspires Floridians to be effective stewards of our planet. What are earth systems you ask? It's the interaction between air, water, land and life and how we influence them. Our mission is to lead the way to a healthier planet by cultivating a responsible and curious society that values, trusts, and has access to science. Tonight's speaker is Dr. Marie Trone, a professor of biology at Valencia College in Central Florida, specializing in dolphin acoustics to improve accuracy and understanding of dolphin population dynamics. She's taught a variety of classes to both science majors and general education students, leading trips to various places around the Florida's coastline, as well as the Peruvian Amazon and the Andes Highlands in order to better expose students to the amazing biodiversity of these regions. Before we turn things over to Dr. Trone tonight, we wanna to go over a few great housekeeping items with you that you can also reference at the top of the chat box anytime at your convenience. First, we hope that you've got something to sip on hand with you and heck, make sure you've got some snacks as well. We wanna make sure that if you've got questions for Dr. Trone, you write those in the chat box and we'll be sure to get to them in a little bit. Next, we wanna make sure that you pay particular attention tonight because there will be a trivia game at the end with prizes from the Science Center. Finally, we encourage you to take a moment at the end of tonight's event to take the survey so we can better understand your experience with us tonight. So without further ado, I'd like to ask Dr. Trone, what does the planet actually have to say? Dr. Trone. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I always love having the opportunity to share um, science in general and just bioacoustics is like my passion. And so um, I guess what I'll start off with is just if you take a look at that picture, that's a picture of the Amazon rainforest and we call that a landscape. It's everything you can see. But tonight we're going to talk about soundscapes. And so if we can click just a little bit for soundscapes, we're going to listen right now because the soundscape is everything you can hear. Wow, and now I hear nothing. <laughs> I don't know if the co-host can hear that. There it is. So the question is, what could you hear? And so we're going to click it again. Awesome. And we have people, it looks like on the chat, listing what those beautiful sounds really, really are. So um, go ahead and click, please, Mr. Brian. So the question is, what do you hear? And in that, you can hear a whole lot more than you would ever be able to see. And that's just because sound picks up everything. And I guarantee you, when I made that recording, I couldn't probably see any of those animals. And in addition to birds, and yes, there were birds in that recording, there were probably some insects, maybe some amphibians, like frogs or something like that. And so those are some of the things that you can detect using a soundscape and, um, survey. 
Next slide, please. And so this is an example of like a 16 minute recording that my colleagues and I worked on where we took recordings from different parts of the rainforest and we used artificial intelligence and we used um, machine learning. And that's not my specialty. Those are the computer magicians like Hervé. And in that little 16 minute recording, we detected eight different species of birds. So you can get an idea of the abundance as well as the biodiversity. Click, we're gonna look at the next slide. And so imagine at night, would you even be able to see any of these animals at night? Not at all, but listen to what you could hear at night. Awesome. So those recordings were made at night up in the top of the canopy. So that picture you see is like where I hung out in between recording sessions all night. Um, but then we went up to about 117 feet up in the air. But there's a lot you can hear that you can't actually see. But the real question is, like, what can't you hear? And so you're like, well, maybe I didn't hear some of those birds or something. But here's the kicker. Let's go to the next slide. We probably heard maybe some birds, some insects, definitely amphibians, but there were bats in that recording and you can't hear them. And that's because, we're gonna to go to the next slide. That's because they talk above the hearing range of a person. And so we call that frequency and people are like, oh my God, what frequency? And frequency is just how often something happens. So today is Thursday. And Thursday, it has a higher frequency than my birthday, which is in August. I still have a long ways to wait. And so higher frequency sounds, which has to do with the change in the pressure, all we associate those with higher pitches. But lower frequency sounds, we associate with lower pitches. So we can take a recording and turn it into a picture that we can see by looking at frequency as well as amplitude. And so the next picture here is going to show you what amplitude is, if we can get a click, there we go. So amplitude is like a guitar amplifier. It just makes a sound louder. So something with a small amplitude is gonna be very quiet, whereas something with a big amplitude is gonna be super loud and you might wanna cover your ears. So we can combine amplitude and frequency over time and you get a picture like you see next. And if we can get a click, there we go. And that's gonna show you that's just a few seconds. Well, it's actually a half a second from a sound I just picked out of my library of music. It's an instrumental song, but where it's red, it's more loud and where it's lighter color, it's less loud. And as you're starting at the bottom, that's low frequency. And as you go up, that's higher frequency. And the most people can hear is up there at the top at that 20 number, that's 20 kilohertz. So we hear from about 0 0.2 to 20 kilohertz. And that's our hearing range. So the bats or above that. We're gonna to go to the next slide. And so here's an example of bat sounds. And notice they're all the way up there in that picture, those little rainbowy blips at around 50 to 55 kilohertz. And let's play part of that recording at night that you just listened to. Yeah, you didn't hear it, but now I slowed that exact same recording down so it moved the bat sounds into the human hearing range. And what you're gonna hear are these little like beep, beep, beeps. And so let's go ahead and play it. And now you're gonna be like a sleuth, a spy. Isn't that cool? Those are bats. And so by slowing it down, what I've done then is if we remove that, go ahead and click that, Brian, please. There we go. We move those higher sounds up there in the 50s range all the way down below 20 so that you and I, we can actually hear them, which is great because I'm half deaf. And so I can be a deaf acoustician because nobody can hear the animals I study anyways. We're gonna go ahead and go to the next sound slide. So not only can we not hear super high sounds, we can't hear super low sounds. So the next thing we're gonna play are some African elephants. My colleague gave me these sounds, although the pictures of Asian elephants, but what you're gonna hear is at normal speed. 
Go ahead, let's play the normal speed. Okay, and I think some of the sounds are just like frogs or something. I don't know, I wasn't in Africa recording. But what we did here, because these are low sounds, we sped them up five times the speed of regular of the regular recording. And then you're gonna hear this roar sound, kind of like an alligator if you're from Florida, you recognize an alligator. But let's play that one. Let's play the elephants faster. Yeah, that, I don't even know what that one was. But the lower sounds, those were elephants. And what's really cool is elephants can hear with the bottoms of their feet. And that low frequency sound can travel a long distance. So low frequency has a higher energy and can travel longer distance, whereas high frequency doesn't have as much energy. And so literally elephants will call like that where you can't hear it, but they will all then like converge on one watering hole. And they hear that through the bottoms of their feet. And they have really interesting bottoms of their feet, which I couldn't find any of those pictures, but they, they really do. And so let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Yeah, oh yeah, there we go. So the human hearing range, what we did was we moved that stuff that was below that blue bar up into something we could hear. So even though we can't hear all the animals, let's go to the next slide. The animals hear us, even if we don't even pay attention. So Dr. Perny Krause, he used to be like a, a sound engineer and he got into recording soundscapes. And back in the mid eighties, he started recording um, at Lake Mono, California. And he noticed over time, like populations of animals were diminishing. There were less sounds and less variety. And one thing he noticed was like when military jets started flying low over Lake Mono, at night doing their little their their exercises even though you and i a jet flies overhead we don't notice these spade foot toads they did notice and the thing is is the spade toad these toads they they would chorus together in synchrony and they do that of course to attract mates and attract girlfriends but when that plane flew overhead it disrupted their rhythm and when it disrupted their rhythm, it took, after the plane was gone, about 20 to 45 minutes as they tried to get back in synchronization again. And then it sounded like it was just one big toad. But in that meantime, in that 20 to 45 minutes, it made it easier for predators like coyotes or owls to find the individual toads and it knocked them off. And after those planes started flying overhead, the population of these spade foot toads started dropping precipitously in the mid 1980s, which it's hard to believe for me that you would think just an airplane could disrupt a whole population of a species in such dramatic ways. We're going to go to the next slide. There we go. So the speed of sound in air, which is what we've been talking about, is about one fifth of a mile or 0.2 miles per second. But the speed of sound in water is on over four times faster. In fact, it's almost a mile per second in the water. And that's because the molecules are so much closer together. And not only is the sound in water faster, it's also louder. So we've been talking about sound in the air. And now let's go to the water, my real, real love. So we're gonna go to the next slide. So here's something totally fascinating. They're called so far channels, sound, fixing and ranging channels. That's what the acronym stands for. So if you go down 800 meters under the water, the water in the upper layer is warm and the molecules are moving and so it's really dense. Then you go down an extra 200 meters to 1000 meters below the water, below the surface, and the temperature stays about the same. It's about mm, four degrees Celsius. But then those molecules are close together because of the pressure of the water, it's super dense. And so between 800 and 1,000 meters is a so far channel. Whereas if a whale were to call in that channel, the sound just kind of reflects off these two denser layers and it doesn't lose a whole lot of energy and just goes whew, all the way across the ocean. It can travel a long distance, especially if it's a low frequency sound. 
go to the next slide. In fact, if you're a whale off the coast of Massachusetts and you decide to call and look for your friend who might be hanging out off the coast of Europe, I'm gonna put a little click here, you're gonna see that sound can travel from Massachusetts over to Portugal in about 36 minutes. Go ahead and click that, here we go. So that sound in a SOFAR channel can go all the way across in 36 minutes. And so for eons, these whales have been talking to each other across entire ocean basins. Click. We're gonna go to the next slide, here we go. Here's the, here's the grab is since about the 1960s, especially when the Navy started listening for submarines underwater, we've noticed that every decade, the amount of noise in the water doubles. So we're getting this exponential increase in ocean noise pollution. Click. I'm going to go to that one. So it is caused by cargo ships and cruise ships and other boats going across the ocean basin. It's caused by seismic exploration where we send sound waves that are super loud, like 100,000 times louder than a jet engine because they're really explosions to look for gas and oil as those sounds reflect off the bottom. And then the military sonar to actually sweep and look for other submarines. Tonight, we're only gonna talk about number one, cargo ships. So we're gonna go to the next slide. So these cargo ships are these huge boats and they have all these containers where we bring parts from one country to another. Well, the sound of those engines, because they're attached to the steel hull of the boat, which by the way, conducts sound better than water. And so that those are rattling and making noises, but so are the propellers as they spin underwater, they create these bubbles, thousands and thousands and thousands of bubbles. And then when the bubbles collapse on themselves, we call it cavitation, it makes these little explosions underwater. And so we're gonna to go to the next slide, there we go. And so just to give you an idea of what it sounds like, I recorded um, some bottlenose dolphins off the coast of Texas at Port Aransas in December of 2017. And to give you an idea, it's a super industrial port. You can see the ferry there, it's got a semi truck, but there's a ferry that brings vehicles back and forth across because, and it's free because it's considered a highway by the government. And there's container ships that come in and out and you can see some oil platforms. Even though there's all this traffic and all this noise, there's always lots of bottlenose dolphins there because it's a great place to find fish. But just to give you an idea of how loud that water is, this is what it sounds like underwater. And that probably I was recording from 150 uh, yards. I'm going to convert to yards away. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide. There we go. So this is some work done by Hatchet et al. But my colleague Chris Clark did a lot of this work. And this is totally fascinating. So as you look on the left, that is a National Marine Sanctuary, um, Stellar Wagon, Stella Wagon Bank. And it's off the coast of Massachusetts. And they put underwater microphones inside of that little rectangular area there so they could record underwater ambient noise. And all those light little blue dots, those are whales calling to each other. And those, if you look on the right-hand side, those yell, that bright yellow with the red, that means the red is super loud, yellow, not as loud. And then as it gets faded out to blue, that's much quieter. Um, that is a cargo ship coming through the feeding grounds of the humpback whales, North Atlantic right whales, and so forth. So when these cruise, these big cargo ships come through, and those other three dots are also big cargo ships, it literally bleaches the water so the whales can't hear each other. And imagine if you're trying to talk to your friend, if you're a whale, that's like off the coast of Portugal. Next. We're gonna go on. And so the whales have been protected, North Atlantic, let's talk about the right whales. The right whales, a lot of the whales have been protected for decades and the right whales have been protected since the 1970s, mid 1970s. However, the Southern hemisphere populations have, they've been making great comebacks. There's about 16,000 estimated in all of the Southern hemisphere combined. But in the North Atlantic Ocean and the North Pacific Ocean, there's only about 400, literally, 
there are 40 whales of right whales in the southern hemisphere compared to the one whale in the northern hemisphere. So why is it? Why is it that the southern whales are doing great and the northern whales not so great? One hypothesis is noise pollution in the water. Okay, next slide. And so we had a chance to do a natural experiment when we had September 11th and the Twin Towers fell. So prior to that, there was a lot of cargo ships going across the ocean, lots of planes flying. And there were some researchers collecting feces produced by the North Atlantic right whales, and they were measuring stress hormones in the fecal matter. And if you look at that graph right there on the far left-hand side, you'll see those hormones were pretty high. But after 9-11, when airplanes quit flying, cargo ships quit traveling, they measured those fecal samples again, and lo and behold, the, the stress hormones dropped in those North Atlantic right whales. And we all know, or we might know, that as you get increases in stress, it compromises your immune system, which is why college students get sick during finals week, or if you're stressed out at work or something, you tend to get sick because the stress hormones definitely compromise your immune system. So this right here was good evidence that noise pollution might be one of the major causes that the North Atlantic right whale population hasn't been able to increase. As an aside, the North Atlantic right whales, most of them at some point have been entangled in fishing gear as well. Okay, next slide. So with that in mind, as dreadful, as dreadful as this coronavirus has been for us, could there be something positive for it, maybe for right whales? Or what about other species? For example, let's go ahead and click there might be something good for maybe bottlenose dolphins. I mean, they're found around our coast, but they've definitely suffered some from, from human activity, such as in the Gulf Coast after the Deep Horizon oil spill. And let's take a look at maybe click, we're gonna look at killer whales too. Um, the North, uh, the, I mean, the Southern residents of the, our country on the West Coast, they've had some problems, click. So, Let's take a look at this. Just in the month of March alone, this month, the number of flights, like in the United States, has decreased by 41%. Imagine if you're a frog. This could be good news. We're going to click again. Worldwide flights, including commercial flights, cargo flights, and everything like that, those have decreased almost 50% around the world. Now we looked for some cargo data on cargo ships and couldn't find any, but I've heard just here and there where there's not nearly as many container ships going, drops in the disruptions in the supply chain and so forth. So we might have right here on our hands a chance to take advantage of another natural experiment, one that wasn't planned. So my friend and colleague, Liz Jensen, who um, has been recording these dolphins off of the coast of Texas, we're gonna zoom in where that little dot is on the next slide. We can get that in there. So you'll see right there, it, that area, there's a lot of estuaries and wherever rivers come together or estuaries, estuaries come together, that's where there's a lot of fish, which even though there's a lot of noise pollution might be why there's lots of dolphins. So let's take a look at the next slide. So again, here is Port Aransas. I'm gonna have us play again the ambient recording. Then, well, let's do that first. Super noisy, okay. Now I took that same recording and I filtered out some of the low frequency sounds and then I also slowed it down. And what you're gonna hear is kind of like a pen clicking, click, 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 click. Those are dolphin clicks. They're echolocation clicks, which I'll explain in the next slide. Let's go ahead and play that sound. And then it's kind of, if we can turn that up just a little bit because there was a second dolphin that turned, chimed in. Or maybe not. You want to try that one more time, Brian? A little louder if you could please. 
Okay, so it's hard to hear, but we have other ones later. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so echolocation, and most of you probably already know this, but this is where the dolphin produces a sound in their head. We're still not 100% a scientist sure how they do that, but as that sound goes off, it reflects off things and comes back to the dolphin to the lower jaw, and then they get an image somehow, we guess, in their mind of what that object is. And it generally reflects off their swim bladder. So let's go to the next slide. So the southern resident killer whales off the coast of like Washington State, they were doing in that population about a hundred whales in the, all of the groups of the residents, not the transients or the offshore whales, but the resident whales, about a hundred. Their numbers keep dropping. And currently there is about, I do believe 78 of these whales remaining. Let's go to the next slide. There we go. They love to eat Chinook salmon. They won't eat anything else. There's lots of other maybe foods such as seals like the transients eat, but they won't eat them. They will only eat Chinook salmon. But that's what we humans like to eat. And we've overfished them. And the populations of Chinook salmon have dropped. And we're going to look at that data in the next slide. So as you can see, there's been a steady decline in the Chinook salmon. So the whales are declining because they're hungry. But there's probably another issue playing into this. And we'll go to the next slide. And that is boat noise. There's tons of boats. There's cargo ships. There's military boats. There's private boats. There's whale watching ships. There's all kinds of boat traffic. And I try to imagine, had I been a killer whale born in the 1950s, how loud my world would have gotten in the last 70 years. And they do live to be sometimes that long. We're going to go to the next slide. So these whales, when we, my colleague right now is working on a study where he's, his name's David Bonnet, and he's recording these whales. And what they do is they, we are getting echolocation clicks from the um, orcas. And as they send those sounds off, they reflect off that swim bladder, which is this little tiny organ which has air, and that reflects back to the whale so they can find it. And literally, when the sea is nice and flat, they can find that little swim bladder from a football field away. When there's a little bit of chop at sea level four, they can only detect that salmon about a half a football field. But when there's all the boats in the area and people have measured the sound, it decreased that sound disrupts the ability of the killer whale to find their food and limits their sight distance using echolocation to just like a quarter of a football field. So none of these problems are ever just one thing. It's never just noise pollution or just a lack of food. But when they come together synergistically, it makes it really hard. And the whales in the southern resident population truly are decreasing in number and are looking skinny and they aren't able to reproduce and produce babies like they used to because they really are hungry. Let's go to the next slide. So we're wondering maybe the reduction in boat traffic is actually helping killer whales find scarce food. And uh, there are some a couple of teams of researchers out there taking advantage of this coronavirus situation to see indeed if this is actually beneficial for our killer whales. And wouldn't that be some good news to come out of the situation? We're going to go to the next slide. So we're going to leave the water and return to the air. Some scientists are looking at this with respect to bird populations. In fact, some people have said, wow, I've been out walking and the birds, they're singing. But that's not really true. Let's go ahead and let you make that decision. We're going to play first the bird call with airplanes in the background. Go ahead. Awesome. Now we're going to play the same species of bird, but without the air airplanes in the air right now. So it seems the birds are louder, but when the scientists have been measuring them, they have actually found, we're going to go to the next slide, 
they have actually found, um, there we go, that the calls that these chiff chaff birds are making are actually have half the energy, half the decibels. And decibels are a logarithmic scale. So they're not actually singing louder, they're actually putting less energy in, but it sounds louder to us because they're not competing with the sounds of the airplanes. And a lot of animals do this. They will make their vocalizations louder when they have to overcome other things in their environment. So again, now it's gonna take them less energy to call. They're more likely to find their mates. And we may see a boom for songbirds, which is a good thing because songbird populations over the last few decades have been dropping as well. And so this again, may be a good thing for the environment. Next slide. And so how did I get into all of this? A friend of mine talked me into going down to the Amazon and recording Amazon river dolphins. These dolphins are just as undolphin as any other dolphin there is. They're just weird. First, look, they're pink. That is not photoshopped. When they get hot, they turn pink. Next slide. In addition to being pink, they're twisted. <laughs> so notice their, this one's face looks kind of weird. This is one I took a picture of at the Quista Cota Zoo in Iquitos, Peru. In Iquitos, Peru, the people there have just been devastated by this coronavirus. But um, he's not deformed. That is totally natural. They got that long mouth and they got that twisted kind of head. And another thing that's weird about them, let's go to the next slide is, go ahead and click, there we go, none of those backbones are joined together. So unlike any other dolphin, they can touch the tip of their mouth to the tip of their tail. And this is an evolutionary adaptation because the water there floods every year up to about 40 to 45 feet. So high water season is 40, 45 feet higher than low water season. And when the water's high, they swim between the trees to go get the fish that they eat. And um, if you were a regular dolphin, that would not be good because you wouldn't be able to go through the trees and you would get stuck. But these guys, they don't get stuck, they follow the fish. Click. So when you listen to these dolphins, generally people for years said, oh, they don't make any sounds. Occasionally there's a whistle and it sounds like this. Go ahead and play it. It's really short. Try it again, like try it three times. <laughs> Not even going. All right, I should have looped it. Sorry about that. Um, but it kind of is like, it sounds like that. And so that's at the lower part of our hearing range. But in the next slide, I slowed it down 90%. And in addition to the whistle, which actually now when you slow it down, sounds like a whale, you're going to hear those clicks, which are the dolphin's echolocation click. And what you see in that picture right there is we can actually get up to like 500 kilohertz. And remember, we only hear that little tiny bit at the bottom. Go ahead and let's play that one slowed. There you go. So you could hear the clicks. And that's not the only thing they do. They do this other thing that we can hear in the lower part of their frequencies, in our frequency. Sorry. Go ahead and go to the next one and let's just play it. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot this one doesn't have Thing. But anyway, we're using those echolocation clips to try to estimate how many dolphins are in the area. And we use multiple microphones under the water. And because there's a fixed speed that that sound travels, the sound gets to one microphone before it gets to the other. And then we can try to triangulate where they are. So we're using what's called time delay of arrival. Okay, but now let's look at some of these other sounds. We hear this sound and we don't have a really good name for it. We call it popcorn when they're hunting. Go ahead and play that. And that's at normal speed. And it kind of sounds like popcorn. We're going to go to the next slide. Not only do we hear it with the wild dolphins, but there's a dolphin at the Duisburg Zoo in Germany that I went to record in 2018. And they feed him live fish. And when they fed him live fish, he also produced popcorn. So let's listen to that popcorn sound slowed down. And in addition, and think about what that sounds like. And in addition to thinking about what the sound sounds like, listen for the clicks. Go ahead. It 
wasn't exactly high fidelity there, but um, it sounded like explosions or cannonballs and literally sound like when they use the seismic um, surveys using those air guns, I mean, it actually causes damage. It kills fish larvae, fish eggs, and causes hemorrhaging to marine mammals. And at the zoo in Germany, when he makes that sound, the fish go, well, they didn't know he was doing it because you couldn't hear it above the water, but they said it was weird. They put the fish in the water and the fish would go limp and then he would scoop it up and eat it. And what I think they're doing is hurting the fish with that popcorn sound. So using sound as a weapon, which again makes evolutionary sense because you can't swim fast when you're sneaking between the trees. So you might as well just get them with a bang. So anyway, I find all this stuff interesting and it's part of my research. We're gonna go to the next slide. There we go. And none of my work would be possible without the help of all the incredibly well-trained, wonderful guides from Explorama Lodges in Iquitos, Peru. And if anybody feels interested in helping those people in Iquitos, all of those people have been laid off. They depend on tourism to, to, um, for their livelihoods. And if you don't have a job, you don't eat. And actually one of my friends has passed away from the virus. Another one has lost his brother. Um, it's not been a very good situation for them. So if you're interested in donating, there's a link there and you can find my email coming up in a moment. Um, and if you email me, I can also send you the link. Again, my work would not be possible. You wouldn't be here listening to me tonight because I would have never gone into this field if it weren't also for those wonderful people you see in that picture. Okay, next. And those are some of the reference studies um, that you saw in this paper or this presentation. And then the next, these are some of the people that have supported me. Um, I get some help. My computer magicians are at the University of Toulon in France. Um, they provide me with equipment. The Dolphin Communication Project provides me with some equipment. And of course, Explorama Lodges has been wonderful to me. Uh, and of course, Valencia College. Again, I wouldn't be here. I'm so grateful for all of those people, Valencia and Explorama and so forth. And I thank you guys for chiming in. And I hope some of you get excited about science because for me, science is like, we've explored every inch of this planet as a human. Science is the only way to go somewhere where no one has gone before and be the first to think of an idea or the first to actually find it. And science is magic to me. So thank you very much. All right, Marie, thank you so much. We are going to transition into our Q&A portion of today's presentation. Our first question from Deborah asks, how did scientists determine a way to capture these frequencies of animals? Was it by accident? Uh, it wasn't necessarily by accident. I mean, in the old days, oh man, Dave Bond is probably listening right now. Like back in the 50s and 60s and 70s, they actually used magnetized tape. And then we switched from analog to digital. And in 2013, actually, I went to a machine learning conference and that's how I met these people from France. And uh, I said, I wanna be able to get these high frequencies. And so far, we're the only research team in the world that has recorded up to, we've done, gone as much as taken 5 million sound samples per second on five different hydrophones. So that's a million sound samples per second. Previously, most people recorded at 96 kilohertz one research team did 200, but we, like last summer I did like 625,000 samples per second. So it's equipment, it's still in the process of being developed and it's not perfect yet. So that's why we haven't figured out how many dolphins are actually there, but we're working on it. Marie, our next question comes from Bruce who asks, do wind turbines at all disturb animals? So that's a really good question. And the answer to that is yes. Um, there was a couple studies done that I've read too, where they like, measured the porpoise population near shore before the turbines. And once they put the turbines in and it definitely seemed to cause problems. But whenever there's a problem, I believe in there's a solution. And a solution is super simple. 
Um, because sound, again, sound travels so far, so fast, so loud underwater. You can make bubble curtains, but you just take a little tube and put some holes in it and put some air through in there and it makes bubbles come up. And air is the best reflector of sound, which is why the dolphins can use the, sound, the gas bladder to find the fish. So if we wanted to use these wind turbines in the water, the best way to make sure the marine life wouldn't be hurt is to use these bubble curtains. Kim is wondering, have changes in technology been better or worse for animals in terms of sound? So both, negative, both positive and negative. So I highly recommend if you like this topic to watch the movie Sonic C. You can buy it for like $2.99 on like Amazon, Vimeo, I think Vimeo. And in there, they also mentioned like these boat propellers, there's solutions to that problem. There are better designed propellers now that one, give the boat better fuel economy so they can go further on less gas and it doesn't produce the sound. And so that's a win-win for industry and for us. So yeah, we had bad technology, but then we improved technology and that can help get rid of the sound problem. Same thing with that seismic exploration to find that oil that's under the rock layers in the ocean. You know, maybe we should be on green energy. I'm gonna keep my opinion out of this, but there are better ways that are more efficient than using those air guns that would give better resolution and that technology exists and it's just a matter of switching over and then animals won't be hurt and we would be able to find the oil if that's the way our society decides to go on. So technology helps and it harms, but whenever there's a problem, there's always, I believe, always a solution. And that, again, I attribute to science. Jim is curious, is there any evidence that humans have caused an extinction of an organism due to sound pollution? Oh, I don't know the answer to that one. I don't know if there's any specific examples to that one. And again, I'm going to say more than likely, it's going to be more than one cause. Um, so I'm going to have to take a pass on that. I don't really know. <laughs> Jasmine is wondering, how has the sound pollution affected the northern right whale populations as a result of COVID-19? So we don't know yet, but I am thinking, um, Jasmine, that the whale population, North Atlantic right whale population, probably are finding their food better. They are probably finding each other. I mean, imagine in the whole North Atlantic Ocean, there's only 400. So that means 200 males, 200 females. And right now isn't exactly mating time. I mean, had it happened a little bit earlier, it might have been a little better because they mate basically November through February-ish. Um, so they mate during our winter time. But right now they're heading north to go find food. And so, you know, it might be, I think it's going to be a good thing for them. You, you know, if nothing else, a reduction in the stress and a reduction in stress is always good for your health. Dave asks, what is the range of pink dolphins? So the range of the pink dolphins, they are found everywhere in the Amazon River Basin, not just the main Oat River itself, but up through all the little tributaries. They prefer shallow water, so they'll be found in water just a few feet deep. In fact, they have to live in shallow water because they kind of rest on the bottom when they sleep, and they sleep with one eye open, one eye shut, because they only rest half their brain at a time. And so they need that shallow water so they can come up and get a breath of air and come back down. And so they are found all throughout. I would ha I don't have any pictures or I would show you, but all throughout the Amazon watershed, up the little tributaries, the main river channel, all the way down to like where the fresh water dumps into the ocean, but they don't survive in salt water. Selena asks, how did you get started looking at sounds in nature? I got, Selena wants to know how I got interested in sounds in nature. I have always been interested in dolphins and don't ask me why. When I was seven years old, I watched National Geographic it was black and white back then with Diana Fossey's work with the mountain gorillas and that was in Pennsylvania and I said to my mom one day I'm going to do what she does which was count gorillas but with dolphins and when I was seven I was designing like sound experiments in my mind like oh I want to figure out how the dolphins are communicating with each other so I'm going to get a pool of dolphins and put a shark statue in and record them 
it's just something I've always, it was like I was born with it. I used to call it a curse. Now, thanks to my friend Pam, I call it my calling. And um, yeah, that's, I was just born with it. Elizabeth, who's tuning in from Peru, asks, do you think pingers used as bycatch reduction techniques affect dolphin communication? Do I think pingers? So that I'm not 100% sure. It's not a constant sound and it's kind of a higher frequency sound. I, where I used to work, we use in a couple places, we used pingers and we trained the dolphins to come to the pingers for two reasons. One, we took the dolphins out to the open ocean and we wanted them to follow us. So we taught them to follow our pingers. And then also in case of hurricanes, if they got lost at sea, we could have them find home, kind of like calling. And the pingers travel far through, you know, fairly far through the water, but it's a higher frequency sound. It doesn't travel as far, but I can tell you things like pile drivers that dig the holes to put the docks in, dolphins do not like that sound and I think it hurts them. Rebecca is wondering, do you know if anyone is studying the effects of sound on animals in the poles as a result of cruise ship traffic? I'm sure, I don't know who's specifically looking at that, but I do have friends that do uh, study animals in the poles and put high, I, now I wish I would have given you the bearded seal sound. All of you out there, you need to Google bearded seal paw. It sounds like something from Star Wars, but they discovered those by putting hydrophones in the water and they're like, what is that? And so people definitely have been studying that. People study beluga whale populations by acoustics. People study um, the big whales and the sounds of the ice. So the ice totally changes the acoustics of both the North and the South hemisphere. Um, so sound definitely is gonna play a part, but the disappearance of the ice is also causing a disappearance in food supply because there's this little copepod, which is like a little crabby thing that eats algae underneath the ice and 80% of its body is oil. And the whales feed on that or on food that feeds on the copepods. And with the loss of the ice, we're losing that bottom part of the food pyramid. So again, it's not gonna be one thing, but several things that are problems for all these different species. Jerry says, I know communication is an issue with noise pollution, but how much is echolocation affected? So we do know where there's boat traffic and noise that a variety of different species will actually shift the frequency of their echolocation clicks or shift the frequency of their calls to accommodate. And sometimes they make it even louder so it takes more energy. But that's clearly been documented where the animals have shifted how the, the, how the pitch, like how high or how low, to get around our noise. All right, Marie, we have time for just a few more questions. Our next one is going to come from Ron, who asked, why is it that pink dolphins hang out where two rivers meet? They do. You, Ron, you're really sharp to know that. They hang out where the two rivers meet because when the rivers meet, that's where the fish collect. And there tends to be more fish there, so that's where they go because it's easy hunting. And actually, there's another species that lives there, the gray river dolphin, and they will fish together and they don't seem to mind sharing. So that's kind of cool. Our next question comes from Stephanie, who asks, with fish bird symbiotic relationships, when it comes to feeding, are they using more sight or sound to work in concert with each other to hunt? OK, can you repeat the which species? Sure. With fish, birds, and the symbiotic relationships that happen between them, when it comes to feeding, are they using more sight or sound to work together to hunt? Well, I know I, sometimes we can find, so we don't always find the river dolphins when we're out there, but we will sometimes, you can see birds hunting. Um, and I probably should have put in a video of just how muddy that water is. If you were to stick your hand under the water, just that, you know, a few inches, you, it disappears. You can't see anything. It's like coffee, it's like cream coffee. And so, the birds, I think, can see the dolphins hunting, and then they'll also join in, but not always. Sometimes we just see a couple of dolphins hunting by themselves, and there's no way they can see, no way whatsoever. The only way they can navigate that is through echolocation, and whenever we see them, if you put a hydrophone in, even though you can't hear it, 
they are always echolocation, echolocating. And we're hoping that we can find unique parts of their voices so that we can create a click print, if you will, to individually identify these dolphins. And I also think that they, mothers and calves will match the frequency and the cadence of their clicks to keep in contact with each other like a contact call, kind of like Marco Polo, Marco Polo. All right. I answered that. <laughs> All right, Marie. And for our final question comes from Becca who asks, how can we reduce our personal contribution to noise pollution? So how do we reduce our own like sound pollution footprint? I mean, at home, I mean, it's, you know, if your vehicle is quieter, we just don't even notice sounds. Like all these species have evolved their sound to not compete with each other so that they can be heard. And truly it's kind of hard to say, you know, it's like, does that mean we got to give up flying because the planes disturb things? Does that mean we got to give up um, all the shipping? And if one person does it, does it make that much of a difference? So cut down consumption, but also I believe there's a tipping point and favor companies that put in those better propellers on their boats or favor companies that do the right thing to reduce the noise in the ocean. Right, contact you know your representative vote. So many people are just like, oh, my vote doesn't matter, but it does. If people go out and vote for representatives that want to help protect the environment and want to do these right things. In the end, when everybody chips in, a little bit makes a big difference. And so I don't give up hope, I keep going forward. Well, Marie, thank you so, so much. At thank this you. point, I'm going to hand things over to Christina from the South Florida Science Center for our round of trivia and prize giveaway. Christina, please take it away. Hey, Brian, thanks so much. And terrific presentation, Dr. Trone, fascinating. Learned so much. So we're gonna have a very brief uh, trivia session tonight with just one question. But now uh, that you've listened to Dr. Trone really closely and her fantastic presentation, I am so sure you will be quick on your feet to answer. Um, before we get started with this one question, uh, what we are gonna be giving away for the correct answer is an awesome pair of beer glasses with a molecular design on them. They have molecules on them. I don't know if you can see them. Pretty close here. Um, the molecules that are displayed on the beer glasses are actually molecules found in beer. We have a pair of them. And inside each glass will be a voucher to do South Brewing for a free fill of any brew of your choice. So really cool. Um, they come in a set like this. They're really awesome. And so to gift these away to the correct answer, I wanna make sure that you have your Q&A box up and ready to go because the first person to answer the one trivia question correctly will win. And then we'll make arrangements for whoever the winner is. Uh, you can either give us your email, you can message us, and we'll make arrangements to get these awesome glasses to you. So is everyone ready? Chat box up and ready to go. Again, first person to answer the question correctly will win these awesome beer glasses. All right, it looks like everybody is ready to go. So here we are. The blue whale's heart weighs approximately 400 pounds basically like the size of piano. As a human under the water, how far can you hear the whale's heartbeat? Is it A, up to one mile, B, two to three miles, C, four to eight miles, or D, 10 or more miles? We have B, that is the correct answer. And I don't know, Brian, if you can help me figure out who that was, because they just all piled up very, very quickly. Who do we have as the winner? Let's see. So 
So it was, the answer was B, two to three miles. I believe it's Brandy Henderson. Brandy Henderson, good job, congratulations. Very, very quick to answer that question. If you can message us, a uh, way to get a, uh, in contact with you to make arrangements to get these to you, or if you're local and you wanna stop by the Science Center to pick them up, let us know. Um, other than that, I think that wraps up tonight's Science on Tap virtual. We hope that everyone enjoyed the conversation about bioacoustics and what the planet has to say. In doing so with health and safety in mind, we encourage you to get outside, stop and listen, and soak in the sounds of nature. We'd like to thank our Brews and Bites partners again, Do South Brewing and Savory Eats Food Truck. We'd also like to give a special thanks to Dr. Trone for being here tonight with us. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of you, all of our virtual friends out there tuning in to our session. Um, you can find a recording of this presentation along with the links that we've provided at a UF Thompson Earth Systems YouTube channel. And the Science Center has exciting news to share. Uh, we are going to safely and partially reopen tomorrow to members only until Sunday, May 24th. The Center will reopen to the general public on Monday, May 25th for a discounted rate and all of the details can be found on the Science Center's website under the Plan Your Visit tab. For more information about all of our programs, please visit the websites on your screen. And once again, thank you and enjoy the rest of your evening. Goodbye. <laughs>